Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm joined by my colleague, Rianne Greaves from Pannoni, where she's the associate partner, where she's an associate partner um, regulatory. So thank you for joining us today, Rianne. Pleasure. Um, Rianne, would you just like to take us a little bit through your career today, just to sort of set, set, the, set the scene for today? Yes, certainly. So um, I've been dealing with health, safety, environmental cases uh, for the past 20 years since I was a trainee solicitor. Um, I came to it because the firm where I did my training was very, very strong in the area. And as soon as I uh, did some training time with that particular department, uh, that was me sold, really, uh, in terms of where my career would end up. Um, and in terms of what I do, um, historically, a lot of my work has been reactive work. So I have been involved in supporting businesses and individuals within businesses when they are subject to some form of regulator attention. So it might be that they receive an improvement notice or an enforcement notice of some sort, or perhaps there's an investigation following an incident and they're going to prosecute it. And so we are criminal lawyers, that, that's what I do. I don't deal with any of the personal injury side of those, those cases, uh, just the, the, the criminal side of it. And as I say, it's typically been supporting businesses and individuals through that process, which can be uh, extremely frightening and stressful, um, particularly where businesses are going through it for the, for the first time. Um, more recently, um, practice, I think, has shifted a little in that um, I think businesses are now more interested in a proactive approach to their health and safety obligations. And so we do a fair amount of training with our clients too, particularly to think about things like preparing for adverse events um, and how best to respond to them. Um, but during the course of my career, I've been very, very lucky to work on some really interesting um, and significant cases. Uh, the biggest case I, I dealt with was the one that stemmed from the Bunfield uh, oil explosion oh, wow. back, in, back in 2010, which was the largest explosion in peacetime Europe. Um, so. That was a very, very significant case and uh, led to a, a three-month trial um, that basically was my life for two years working on that case. Um, so that was, that was the largest case I've dealt with, but I've dealt with a whole range of different, different clients in different sectors, different sizes of organisations, and as I say, with individuals. So um, it's the variety that uh, keeps me going and gets me up in the morning. Yeah, no, fantastic. And I think you mentioned that you do health safety and environmental yeah. law as well. You deal with the after it. So you mentioned a moment ago that when you were a trainee, trainee lawyer and, 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 you, and you worked in the regulatory department or the health and safety function, um, function is probably the wrong word, but you said it was sold to you. How did you mean it was it was it was sold to you? Oh, what, it wasn't. Was, it wasn't was... I think I was sold more than it was sold to me. Um, I think. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was uh, when, when you start out as a, as a solicitor, you do your training contract and you work in different areas of your firm, um, doing different disciplines to try and decide where do I want to end up. Um, and for me, I was in a big corporate firm um, and I went to the SHE department um, and all of a sudden I found myself in Crown Courts with juries, I found myself in inquests, I found myself in police station interviews. Um, uh, there's probably something quite odd about me that found that all that really, really <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, and to me, it was just real law. Um, and that, that's yeah. what, what most attracted me to it, um, along with, I think, the fact that at the end of these cases, I feel like I've, I've helped, I've supported. Nobody goes to work you know, to, to injure people or to cause environmental damage. Um, you know, I could count on the fingers of one hand the number of times that I've had a client who I genuinely thought had no regard for these matters yeah. at all. Um, and so for the most part, people make mistakes, people get things wrong, um, and it, it's frightening and it's stressful for them, particularly if you've had a fatal accident. Um, and so I think being able to help people through that process, um, help them to understand it and support them it, it, is rewarding. Uh, in the middle of December, we're in the last the last negotiations of of, of, of what of what the new world is going to look like once once we leave Europe at the at the end of this year. Or well, not leaving Europe, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and uh, what do you foresee any changes to health, safety, or environmental legislation in the immediate term? 
Well, I think um, from the perspective of health and safety professionals, uh, we're probably in a group that can take some certainty from the current situation in that there, I, I don't see any major wholesale changes to health and safety legislation. Uh, obviously, there are some amendments that are going to be made around CE marking and reach um, and things of that nature. But as a whole, um, we will be sticking for the foreseeable future, I think, with the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, we, it's been with us since the 70s. It's very well understood. Um, and as a nation, our health and safety performance compares very, very favourably to other major economies around the world. Um, and so if it's not broken, I don't see why we would try to fix it. No, no. I, well, that's, that's reassuring to hear. Um, I, I think with the introduction of the building safety regulator, um, that's probably going to have more of a more of a focus for for most people within within health and safety i guess would you agree or yeah i think so i think so i think obviously it feels like progress is quite slow at the moment obviously this has all been um invigorated as a result of the awful tragedy at grandpa's tower um and obviously the phase two inquiry is, is carrying on at the moment into what happened there um but i think it, it can feel like progress is a bit slow but i think in the year ahead we will see things really starting to change. Obviously, we know that the new building safety regulator is going to be set up within the HSE. And it will be interesting to see how far um, the, the tentacles, if you like, of these changes go, because I think whilst the focus has been very much on the uh, residential, the high-rise residential sector, um, then I think we may well in time, not in the immediate future, but maybe in the, the medium term future, we may see some of the general themes um, that will be included within the building safety legislation applied in the cases of other buildings as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because a lot of what Dame Judy Hackett has, has talked about already in the work that she's been doing to bring us to where we are now. Um, is building upon the CDM regulations, um, which, you know, have, have found their way finally and started to bed down, I think, after numerous iterations. Um, so it will be it will be interesting to see. But certainly, I think for those dealing with high rise residential uh, buildings, particularly, but also um, those, for example, in hospitality hotels, that kind of thing. Um, next year will be will be one to watch and keep a close eye on. Right, well, watch the space. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. Well, one think. of the questions that the alumni asked was um, if you're aware of any um, any action um, by the HC against people working from home, you know, lack of DSE controls, whatever that may be. And if there has been, um, uh, what has the impact of COVID been on your own work, really? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I mean, as you can see, I'm not in a professional law office at the moment. I'm sat in, in our little <laughs> home office here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like many people, I have been a home worker now since the beginning of March, um, which has it, its pros and cons, as I'm sure it does for, for, for many people. I think people have found themselves in a variety of different challenging situations for me it has been having my two primary school age children at home with me for a lot of the time whilst working and teaching them um, uh, for other people it's been at home alone um, it's been not having an appropriate place to work I'm very fortunate that I've got somewhere I can sit comfortably yeah. and do my job um, so I think it has been been difficult um, for, for businesses in terms of the, the question you've had from your alumni, um, no is the answer. I haven't heard of any any questions, queries. You know, certain of our, our clients have been getting in touch with us to ask our advice in terms of whether we think they're doing the right thing, does their risk assessment cover all the appropriate angles. Um, but in terms of regulatory attention, no, we haven't seen, seen any of that. Um, I think principally, because uh, for offices, obviously they would be enforced by the local authorities. The local authorities have been absolutely swamped with their with their, their own responsibilities under, under the, all of these new COVID regulations that are coming out in different uh, versions on almost a weekly basis. Um, so that, that's been very, very difficult there. And also the risks 
to home workers, you know, we understand them because we're used to dealing with these sorts of conversations. Um, but to the world at large, you know, the, the local authorities, they need to be concentrating on retail, on hospitality venues, on those sorts of places yeah. at, at the moment. Um, and I think even in HSE enforced sectors, there has been very, very few cases of any sort of real enforcement action. Um, and I don't expect that to change. Um, I think no. there's a recognition from the HSE that as long as employers are trying to do the right thing, um, that you know they will try to, I think, regulate by advice um, and look for cooperation as opposed to their more typical approach. Um, you know, for example, in the aftermath of, of an adverse incident. Um, I think it's interesting, the home worker point, particularly um, given, you know, we talked about DSC assessment single question. Um, the HSC position has always been, if somebody's working at home temporarily, then you don't really need to take any extra steps. Now, obviously, that was perhaps okay in the middle of March when we were all sent away from yeah. our offices. Um, but this is probably stretching what temporary means now. Um, and you can see, you know, the HSC is now suggesting sending out the, uh, they, they've got a checklist, haven't they, in terms of uh, people doing their own self-assessments and things like that. So I think that's changing. But, you know, you would hope with the vaccine-shaped light at the end of the tunnel that, you know, maybe we are coming towards certainly the final furlong of being at home. Uh, no, no, thank you. Thanks for that. I mean, one of the questions um, that I think I posed to you when, when we first had a, had a chat was whether or not HSC or you see it foreseeable that HSC might be doing some retrospective investigations from things that have happened over the over the last nine, are we in nine months now? Something like that, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and because uh, they have been this sort of, you know, understandably, this kind of one policy organization for the last for the last you know nine months. Do you think there'll be any retrospective investigations that go on? Is that something they can do? We'll yeah, I mean do? they can, they can, and I think they probably will. I think, as you say, um, COVID's overtaken everything. Um, I'm certainly seeing in my practice area now that um, investigations that had started pre-COVID and there was a long delay, um, they're starting to pick back up again now. Uh, and I do think that where there are the more serious incidents, there is the possibility of them coming back to things. Um, it's important, I think, for organisations to remember that there is no statutory limitation period on the HSE on, on, on health and safety offences, basically. So these are not offences where the HSE will get to a point where they're statute barred from taking any action. Um, they have to, you know, they, they have to bring it within a reasonable period of time. But we are, you know, you, you, I imagine many of your members will, uh, will will know that these are not quick process and it can often be months or years before before things come to fruition. So I think it's important to remember that just because they haven't shown any interest up to now doesn't mean that they won't. Um, certainly, yeah. I think that some things that would normally be investigated will fly under the radar. I think that's just a fact of, yeah. of, of where we are and how much they've had to do. I guess um, in the light of, of the COVID and the lack of activity over the last, say, nine months, it's going to take even longer for more serious offences to get through the courts. I imagine there's going to be one heck of a, of a backlog at, at the moment to get things through. Or, well, the know. criminal courts were, uh, there was a huge backlog in the criminal courts before COVID happened. Um, and we are certainly seeing cases now being lifted well into the back end of 2021, maybe 2022. Really? So, yeah. Well, yeah. That, that in mind, it, it kind of brings me to our next question, really. I mean, you guys as a profession, um, you know, I, I've, I've used you for um, contracts and that sort of thing. You're expensive. You know, you're, you're, and I'm sure there's lots of really good reasons for that, Rihanna. You know, you're an expertise, you're a profession, you're, and actually that's just the nature of things. Mm. But why should why you know why should I engage you if I was if I you know if I'm working for an organisation I don't mean you I mean the, why why is it important yeah. to hold that expertise and and if you could give a little um, uh, explain a little bit around legal privilege as well because I still don't think it's that well known really yeah okay no problem 
Um, I mean, from my perspective, I will always say to a client, I would like to know about an adverse event as soon as possible. I would like to be one of the first people that they get in touch with. Um, and the cynics will say, well, that's because that's a great opportunity for you to make more fees for your firm because, you know, you're in there straight away. Um, the reality is it just makes dealing with the case far easier for me. It doesn't yeah. mean I have to be hugely involved in everything that happens from, the, from day one. But what it does mean is that I'm able to talk to the decision makers within the organization quickly to set things up in the right way to give the business the best chance of putting its best foot forward, basically. So, for yeah. example, one of the first things that I would ask um, the business to do would be to carry out a robust internal investigation and to do that so that I could provide them with legal advice and in making that written request to the business which is something that you know I've done a hundred times if not more uh, it takes me you know 10 or 15 minutes to draft the relevant instruction um, and in doing that it covers that investigation by legal privilege and what I mean by legal privilege um, is um, we like to refer to it as our lawyer's superpower. We don't have many superpowers, but that's one of them. <laughs> our lawyer's superpower. And legal, what legal privileges mean is that everything that passes between me and my clients when I'm advising them, particularly where it's in relation to possible legal action, is covered by legal privilege, which is basically a special variety of confidentiality. Uh, and what that means is that you can carry out a full and fearless investigation into um, the incident, provide it to me so that I can provide advice. And you don't then have to share that with the regulators. Health and safety regulators have very wide ranging powers, as I'm sure your members will know, um, under section 20 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. And one of those powers is to compel production of documents. So for example, you will typically get a request for the risk assessment or the training records of the people involved things like that. Um, if, you, if the business is not willing to hand those over voluntarily, the HSC can compel them. You must do this, otherwise you commit a criminal offence if you don't. Uh, but one of the exceptions to that power is legal privilege. They can never compel you to provide them with something that is covered by this, this particular type of confidentiality. And the reason why it's important is because, you know, as your members will know, after an adverse in, a, incident of some sort, you have to ask the tough questions. You have to understand what's gone on. Um, and I have to understand that in order to be able to advise a business in relation to a criminal investigation and the prosecution. And um, the really, really helpful thing about doing that really early on is that it allows me to make an early case assessment. It allows me to understand if there's a vulnerability, where it is, what it looks like. I can advise what I think the HSC or whoever the regulator might be, what they, what I think they're going to be interested in. Um, it means that we can plan how to respond responsibly to the regulator. It's not about hiding things from, from, from anybody. It's about making sure that you're responding in the right way. And I say that because people like me, we go into a case on day one, and whilst we know we're at day one, we're thinking two or maybe three years ahead to what happens if this case ends up at the Crown Court? Um, the HSE have a 95% conviction rate. So a lot of what we do is we talk to people about damage limitation, about sentencing. Um, the sentencing guidelines have changed hugely the way that these cases are dealt with and the types yeah. of penalties that businesses can receive. And so that's why setting, setting out a strategy early is really, really important in terms of helping a business do go through that whole process in the right way. No, thanks. What what would you then say is a I can't forget how you phrase it. You use another term there about doing incident investigation full and fiercely. I think you said which are which are which are really yeah. like. What was that? What was full the phrase? Full and fearless. I mean, to be full and fearless. Full and I, fearless. I, yeah, but I mean, I yeah. I have to say, I think that's often not a problem with health and safety professionals because I think in my experience um, you are always more devastated than anybody else when an accident happens mm -hmm. and there is a lot of soul searching that goes on um, 
And that is also another reason to have the, the legal privilege in place, because I think uh, many times in my experience, health and safety practitioners are too critical themselves. Um, and it does, okay. them, it, yeah, it does them no favours to have written all of that down. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it is important. Yeah. No, I, well, we all try to learn from we have these mm. instances and you say if we could be disadvantaging ourselves at the same time, um, you know, and that's the system. So, you know, that's why we engage experts like yourself to, to support us through that. So you mentioned there about the sentencing guidelines. Obviously, we've, we've had them for a while now. Um, I was at a large construction company recently and they, they were very, very good, responsible construction company. But they 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 suggested that they're actually budgeting for a significant fine sometime in the future. And this is not an organization that doesn't, you know, that's why I was talking to Nibosh, they take their health and safety responsibilities mm. incredibly seriously by the nature of their industry. Um, there is always, there's a potential for, for, for something to happen. Um, do you find in your experience that, that now the health and safety profession is taken more seriously as a result of the sensing guidelines or, or is there any, any lessons to be learned around around the introduction of the, of the sentencing guidelines? Uh, I think in my experience, I would say that, yes, I think many organisations um, have had the, uh, have woken up actually um, to, to the importance of the right. responsibilities. I mean, I think uh, there are many, you know, you talked about the, the construction company that, that, that you were dealing with, who will, will always have taken their responsibility very, very seriously. But I think when you start to yeah, talk okay. in terms of the millions of pounds, you know, for um, health and safety offences and terms of fines, um, then all of a sudden you get the attention of other key stakeholders within businesses who perhaps weren't that bothered before or weren't that interested in it. So, yeah, I certainly see from my own uh, my own practice that, um, that there are uh, there is an increased awareness, increased interest in health and safety matters and environmental matters as well. Because it's worth saying, yeah. I know many of your your members will be dealing with environmental cases as well. Um, the, there is a, the environmental sentencing framework is a virtual carbon copy. Well, actually, the health and safety is carbon copy. The environmental one, which came first. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we're seeing huge, huge fines now for. Um, what previously would have been, you know, relatively small fines in magistrates' courts are now seeing, you know, millions of pounds in crown courts, and the whole thing, the stakes have been raised. So yes, I, I do see businesses taking more seriously. Yeah, well, that's good. It's good to well, it's good to hear. It makes our lives a bit easier, but also um, if it gets it gets the attention where you where you want it. The last question I got asked around actually was. Um, uh, is there any uh, recent case law that we should be aware of um, that you'd like to bring to our attention? Well, we've actually had a really, really significant few weeks, um, which is not often right. the case, I have to say, from a, a health and safety perspective, um, particularly since the introduction of the sentencing guidelines. We've seen less of it, I think it's fair to say. Um, but yeah, in the last few weeks, we've had a couple of quite significant decisions. Um, the first one was by um, a decision by the High Court and it was following a judicial review that had been brought by a union representing a number of um, drivers, couriers, um, people employed, well, I say employed, working in the gig economy. Uh, and their members had worked throughout the first lockdown um, and many of them had not been provided with any PPE, um, felt unsafe, continuing to work. Um, and the, the case was brought by the union that effectively said the UK has failed to implement properly two EU safety directives, which would have entitled workers in the wider sense rather than simply employees to, 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 to be given PPE in these circumstances. And also to be able to say, I don't want to work, I refuse to work when, um, when I feel like I'm in danger. Um, and uh, it was interesting, the court did note the fact that these directives had been in place for, I think, bordering 30 years and nobody had ever raised this before. But as the court said, just because no one's ever said it before doesn't mean it's not a valid point. Um, and interestingly, they decided that there had been a failure by the UK government to... Uh, to appropriately transpose the directive. Um, and so what that means now is that the many, many people working in the gig economy 
um, can call on the, the, the businesses that they're working for to provide them with, with PPE and also, as I say, to have the right to be able to say, actually, no, we don't feel safe working in these particular conditions. Um, I think it's fair to say that's probably going to be appealed. It may, it may well already have been appealed. The court set a deadline at the end of November for mm. the Department of Working Pensions to appeal against that decision. But I think it was inevitable at some point, given the scale of the gig economy now, the number of people working in these types of informal arrangements, and um, some there would be a challenge of some sort, um, because I think our health and safety laws, we've talked about right at the very beginning, it's been with us since the 70s, but it was designed for very traditional company yeah. structures and, and businesses with employees. Um, and so I think it was inevitable that somebody would would challenge it now that the working world looks very different. Why, why do you think it will be challenged by the Department of Works and Pensions, that ruling? It would seem quite proportionate to me, but I might be, I'm sure I'm being very naive. Well, in, in I, they, they, were, they were granted leave to appeal at the end of the case. Um, during the course of the, um, the, the, the judgment, it was clear that, you know, the case there had been arguments about the fact that it had been, the, the UK file, it had been appropriately transposed. Um, the HSE also, interestingly, came down on that side. They felt that the certainly the general duties under Section 2 and 3 of the Health and Safety Work Act were, I mean, they are very general, as we all know, but were yeah. sufficiently broad to encompass um, all of this. Um, and so they, they seem to indicate that there would be, would be an appeal of some sort. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, you have to look at the difficulties again for the HSE, particularly of regulating um, that sector. But you know, if if it turns, if this is where we end up, that you know these directives haven't been properly transposed, I think it's going to make huge different. It's going to make a huge difference to those gig economy businesses that have very lean structures and they don't have that huge amount of formality around the arrangements that they have with people working with them um, okay. it's going to make a real difference okay. and it's going to be a costly difference too. Okay. Thanks, Chloe. And th there was one last case. I, I, inter I interrupted you there. Forgive me. There was um, yeah. um, there's one other case you wanted to bring to our, to our attention. Yeah. So the other case uh, to bring to your attention was the Supreme Court case, uh, which was decided a couple of weeks ago, um, and it relates to inquests. So in coroner's inquests will happen where there has been a workplace fatality. This particular case um, surrounded the death in custody. Um, and mm -hmm. it's a very lengthy judgment and one that I think it's fair to say none of us uh, doing my kind of work particularly anticipated would have huge ramifications for us. Um, but it was all about um, the burdens of proof and the standard of proof that um, a jury in an inquest would need to be satisfied um, to reach various conclusions. So at the end of an inquest, the jury uh, in a workplace instance, for example, will decide, was this an accident? Was it misadventure? Um, uh, and so on. One of the options open to them is unlawful killing. Um, they can reach that decision um, where they've seen evidence that um, there is perhaps a corporate manslaughter case or a gross negligence manslaughter case, basically where there's been a, a, a crime by a corporate or an individual uh, involved. And typically, it has always been the rule that they would have to, if they wanted to decide that, they would have to be sure in the same way as they would in a criminal court, so beyond reasonable doubt. Um, mm. But in, in this particular Supreme Court case, um, the court decided, uh, it, was all about, uh, it was all about the verdict of suicide, but the court decided actually, for reasons of consistency, we should make all of these verdicts only available on the balance of probability. So what that means is now, in a workplace fatality situation where the jury is thinks it's more likely than not that there was some sort of criminal killing, right. uh, they can reach the conclusion of unlawful killing. Um, uh, so it, it's now we've gone from 100% sure to kind of 51% <laughs> at, the, at the base level. Um, and that makes a huge difference. Um, it's going yeah. to make a huge difference yeah. to organisations because, honestly, most workplace fatality cases are not manslaughter cases. Um, there can be very, very complicated chains of events that, that go to create the very, very tragic situations. But, you know, most of them are not manslaughter. But what we will find now 
is that many businesses will go into the inquest situation with very real risk that there will be an unlawful killing conclusion. And whilst they, the, the jury is not allowed to say an unlawful killing by XYZ Limited, you know, if there's only one employer in, involved in the case, it's going to be fairly obvious um, who, who the conclusion relates to. Uh, and, you know, for an organisation, as I said, most of the organisations that I've dealt with in my career have been trying to do the right thing. There's pretty much nothing worse that you can say about an employer than they've killed somebody. Um, and yeah. so I think it will have a, a radical change. Um, it will radically change the way people deal with inquests. It will increase the importance of the early involvement of people like me, going back to the discussion we had earlier, um, because businesses will be very, very concerned about the ramifications. So, Rihanna, I know we spoke before. Um, you're more than happy for people to link in with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can find you're active you're active on, on, on LinkedIn. So it's Rihanna Greaves from Pannoni. Pannoni, that's right, isn't it? Yep, Pannoni Corporate, Pannoni, that's it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you ever so much. Thank um, you. I hope to speak to you again soon. Great, thanks Take a lot. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye.